My name is Matthew, I'm a fourth year philosophy student. I'm very happy to see you here. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm just going to share, uh, take a few moments just to tell you about why we've put this event on um, and uh, sort of uh, let you know about the format for this evening. So I decided to put this event on, I'll admit, for selfish reasons. Um, I consider myself to be in a relatively low information position on this subject. I wanted to understand what was going on. Uh, I also wanted to show that it's necessary and possible uh, for us to come together. Uh, when we have disagreements, however severe, uh, and bring our arguments to the table uh, outside of the uh, political influence and interests of state actors and mainstream narratives. Um, so I thought we're in a university, let's get people together in a room, um, start from the beginning, uh, and uh, yeah, and work through this in pursuit of truth and a resolution to, to human suffering. Um, I wanted to facilitate the creation of a space for discourse in the hope that we can provide an educational and clarifying series of events to those who, like me, find themselves overwhelmed by the wide variety of uh, conflicting perspectives and feel reluctant to engage out of fear of finding themselves tarred with the brush of Islamophobia or anti-Semitism. I also wanted to create a space where those more familiar with the subject can bring their insights and contribute to this discussion, um, either via the panel uh, or via the question and answer segment that we'll have towards the end. Um, for those of you who booked a ticket, uh, you'll have seen this event is the first of hopefully three, um, each focused on different periods in this conflict's history. Um, today we'll be discussing the early history, uh, what and who occupied this land up until the creation of the State of Israel. Uh, the second event will be focused on the dynamic between Israel and the Palestinians throughout the rest of the 20th century. And the third and final uh, will be on the recent history and the events that led up to um, and what followed last year. Um, Athan and I made a commitment when we decided to put this uh, event on that we would, for the duration of these events, suspend judgment um, so that we can open ourselves up to the stories that people have to tell on this subject um, free from any biases that we may have. Uh, while we may not ultimately be able to achieve neutrality, it was important to us that we try. Um, we wanted to create a safe space for disagreement and not from disagreement on this subject. And we want to encourage a courageous and honest, honest engagement on this issue uh, from all and any who may have something to say. Um, this is why we've chosen the format that we have. The first 80 or so minutes uh, will be committed to an uninterrupted moderated conversation between Athen Yanos uh, and our speakers. Uh, this will be followed by a short break and then a Q&A um, that will run for uh, up to 90 minutes if we need it to ensure that there's plenty of time for engagement from yourselves. Yeah, and last but not least, I just want to say thank you for John uh, for volunteering to chair the event. And uh, yeah, I'll pass you over to Athen and our speakers. Thank you. So first of all, thank you, Matthew and John again. Uh, Matthew, thank you for the speech. So this is how it's going to go down. So I'm going to introduce the speakers. And then we are going to, I'm going to hand it over to uh, our first speaker, Jamie, who's going to go through uh, the first timeline. And then uh, we're going to have a discussion about that. And then uh, John is going to go through the second timeline discussion about that. And there's four timelines uh, that we're going to go through and then have that discussion followed by a Q&A. Uh, so that's enough for me. Let's talk about our very intelligent and smart speakers. So first up, we have John McHugo, who is the author of A Concise History of the Arabs, Syria, A Recent History, and A Concise History of the Sunnis and Shias. Uh, and he's also a trustee of the Balfour Project, which many of you might have flyers for. Uh, and he's also a board member of the CAABU, aka the Council for Arab British Understanding. Despite this, he wishes to stress that tonight he is not speaking on behalf of the Balfour Project or the CAABU, but purely in his own personal capacity. The views he expresses are his alone. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Jamie Allenson, who is a professor of politics and senior lecturer, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, not yet. <laughs> okay, well, he's a senior lecturer of politics and international relations at the University of Edinburgh with a particular interest in the contemporary Middle East. He is also the author of The Struggle for the State in Jordan, uh, The Social Origins 
of alliances in the Middle East and the age of counter-revolution, uh, states and revolutions in the Middle East, which that last book I'm personally a big fan of, I told him. Um, so that's it. Now we are going to begin with the first timeline, which goes very far back to uh, 70 AD and leads to the Ottomans' uh, conquering of Palestine in 1517. So um, I will briefly lead you guys, quickly go through this and lead up to the start of the Ottoman control of Palestine, and then I'll hand it over to Jamie. So in 70 AD, the Romans retake Jerusalem from the Jews and destroy their second temple. Uh, that's very significant because that remains a very holy spot for the Jews right now. Then fast forward to 636, the Muslims conquer Palestine, which gradually becomes an Arab-speaking uh, population. Now, fast forward to 1091 to 1291, the Crusaders occupy much of Palestine. Then in 1291, the Egyptian Mamluks uh, take over Palestine, defeating both the Mongols and the Crusaders. And then moving to 1492... Well, okay, I'll go to 1517 first and then come back to 1492. But 1517, the Egyptians conquer and take over Palestine. The Ottomans. <clears throat> Sorry, I meant to say the Ottomans. The Ottomans conquer and take over Palestine. And then uh, the reason 1492 is important is because uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese expel Iberian Jews from the Iberian Peninsula, uh, causing the Ottoman Empire, in large part, to have the largest Jewish population in Europe. In the world. In the world, too. Uh, also in Europe. Uh, but so, yes. Uh, and so now, as you guys know, uh, Ottoman Empire has the largest Jewish population in the world, and it's 1517, and the Ottomans have control of Palestine. So, Jamie Allenson. Okay, thanks, Athan. Um, <clears throat> before we start, I think there are probably a couple of things worth picking up. The first is it might seem odd to have uh, two white men discussing the history of Palestine without any Palestinians on the panel. Um, oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know that Palestinians were asked, but Palestinians are reluctant perhaps to take the stage at the moment Partly they've got better things to do because of what's happening to their families and communities, as well as being afraid. So I know that free speech is an academic freedom is one of the concerns of the organizers. There's a massive attack at the moment on free speech in general, and academic uh, freedom in particular to do this issue. And it's directed one way. It's directed against the supporters of the Palestinian cause, and it is directed against those within academia who question an established narrative about the origins of the State of Israel. So <clears throat> there have been hundreds, literally hundreds of cases of people being uh, disciplined, uh, subject to vexatious complaint, uh, other forms of uh, kind of disciplinary procedure in universities in this country, up, and, up to and including being arrested and the police coming onto this campus uh, to go into student meetings. So there's a real threat going on and it's only going one way. So it's not surprising that you might find a certain uh, imbalance uh, in the panel. I think it's also important to remember, so there are two, I think, ways that people conceive of this conflict that are basically wrong. One is that there is a kind of state called Palestine. There's a country, Palestine. Palestine's fighting Israel. And why is Palestine always fighting Israel? Like Russia and Ukraine, for example. That is not the case. So there are the Palestinians, there is no sovereign Palestinian state because the state or the society that occupied Palestine, which I'll speak about until 1948, was destroyed in 1948 to make way for the state of Israel, expelling the Palestinians into where they now live, leaving about half of them, the rest of them ending up in places like Gaza. That's why Gaza has two million people in it. They lived in what is now Israel. They are the indigenous inhabitants of that place. So that's the first point. The second point, which is very commonly assumed or is very current in kind of political responses to the present crisis, is to see this in some way 
And here we have to be a bit careful with the timeline, I think, to see this in some way as a conflict between two global religious entities, Muslims and Jews, and that therefore something that you say about this conflict or this situation is in some way either an attack on Muslims or Jewish communities in this country, that somehow the Palestinians and Israel are representatives of two religious traditions that have always been in conflict and that this is an age-old um, kind of war. That is untrue. It is not age-old. It's about 100 years old and it is not religious. It's not about religious uh, ideas. It's about the settlement of this particular land, Palestine, by a movement of people from Europe who were Jews, but not representative necessarily of the majority of the Jewish population in the world at that time. So those are two things to bear in mind. We also heard about the expulsion or the kind of the second temple. Now, there really, there was a second temple. There was a kingdom of Judah, it was a Jewish kingdom. The kingdom of Israel, which was a separate thing, had actually ceased to exist about 500 years previously. That was the Northern Kingdom, if you remember your Bible studies. We don't actually know that there was a first temple. So the second temple is a, possibly a misnomer. And we also can't be sure that the people who are expelled from uh, what became the Roman province of Palestine in 70 AD ended up becoming the Jewish diaspora. So those things are separate. It's generally the opinion, I'm no expert on this, but most ancient historians are generally of the opinion that the religious and cultural elite of the kingdom of Judea was expelled or sent into exile, but the vast majority of people remained and ended up becoming Muslims, Christians, maybe some of them remained Jews. But just like all the other areas of this uh, part of the world, basically the religion changed. So it's important to understand that. Now that doesn't mean that there's no legitimacy to the place that this land has in the kind of Jewish religious and cultural tradition, but it is a religious and cultural tradition uh, rather than necessarily one of a kind of fact of descent, which is important because I think what we learn from some of the history we'll talk about and definitely the history of the 20th century is that the idea of politics and national identity and states based upon ethnic descent is a bad one. And it's generally, generally at the root of most of, uh, most of these problems. So to come on to where we are here, under the Ottoman Empire, there wasn't a particular area called Palestine. So it's part of other administrative units connected either to Beirut or Damascus in the north, a separate, um, a separate uh, area around Jerusalem in the middle, and then more to do with the Hejaz, so the Arabian, northern part of the Arabian Peninsula in the south. There's no separate unit that we would call Palestine. Although the term was used in a loose sense, but people often also refer to this area as Syria, and the inhabitants of the area would probably just have referred to it as Bilad Asham, or the, what we call the Levant, so that part of the Eastern Mediterranean. Under the Ottomans, it was a fairly kind of tolerant society in a sense. So not in our sense, not the way that we think everybody has individual equal rights to freedom of religion and so on. But different religious communities basically ran their own affairs with a kind of ruling Sunni Muslim elite. So they were un undoubtedly in charge, but basically most of the society ran fairly autonomously. And that included in this area, greater Syria, let's say, yes, communities of Muslims, but also very large communities of Christians and um, a fair number of Jews. So there were Jewish communities in this area the idea that we'll perhaps hear about from John, that this was a land without people, so uninhabited, is completely untrue. Not only was it not a land without people, it wasn't even a land without Jewish people. It had an indigenous Jewish community in it, um, who were not generally subject to the kind of Judeophobia and anti-Semitism that happened in Christian Europe. So in the Islamic empires generally, 
and the Ottoman Empire particularly, there were outbursts of kind of attacks on religious minorities, Christians, Jews, Shia, non-Sunni Muslims. It happened from time to time. But this whole ideology of there being some kind of race of people who are need to be controlled or exterminated or some particular threat, that's a completely European thing. It's not present even in the most kind of, uh, let's say, most conservative forms of Islamic and Arab discourse in the 19th century. It appears later. It begins to appear with some events, probably not with the peasant revolt. So basically, Muhammad Ali, who was a leader of Egypt in the 1830s, took what is now Palestine from the Ottoman Empire's control. And that began to, because Muhammad Ali was trying to create state structures like European ones, began to show those ideas in Palestine. So that's why it's important, because people began to get these kind of ideas. Against Muhammad Ali's troops, there was a peasant revolt in which lots of people were killed, including a lot of people in Safed, which is a predominantly Jewish town, but probably just because they were in a town. There were lots of other towns that were uh, subject to this. But there was a particular incident in Damascus which came to attract, it's important, because it came to attract the interest of Christians in Europe, particularly in this country and in Scotland, um, about it, and a, a blood libel, so the kind of anti-Semitic conspiracy theory against the Jews that they are using the blood of Christian children for ritual purposes, which is a completely European thing, does not appear in the Middle East until this point. And it was actually fostered by um, Italian Catholic priests amongst the Christians of Damascus in order to offer a kind of a strategic entry point. But that led to a discussion about what do we do about the Jews of the Middle East in this country, and therefore in general, about the idea of what they called restoring the Jews to uh, the Holy Land, which is the origin really of the idea of Zionism. It's Christian, basically. It's a kind of Christian idea of rest restoration. Um, of course, we're going through a lot of time periods here, but <clears throat> in this time, the Ottoman Empire was trying to introduce reforms which would increase a kind of more capitalist economy. So increase tax revenues by giving people individual private land holding, which meant that you got big landowners who were the people who eventually could sell the Palestinians' land to settlers, and to try and create modern state structures. And this was going on in Palestine as much as anywhere else. As a result, the population increased, 500, 700,000 perhaps at the end of the 19th century. It became quite prosperous in many ways. They were exporting fruit and textiles across the Mediterranean from ports like Gaza, Haifa, Acre, Jaffa, um, <clears throat> and developing kind of cultural institutions, newspapers, uh, various associations and so on. So the point is there was a society there. It was not without people. It was not just a desert. It's very much an Eastern Mediterranean uh, culture, society that exists. Now, the reason that that came not to exist, we'll hear a bit about the actual settlement enterprise, I think, in a bit from John, was the Ottomans entered the First World War on the side of the central powers, so the Germans, and they lost. Britain, which didn't really care that much about this area, but wanted, of course, to defeat a, a German ally, took Palestine, or took, it defeated the Ottomans in 1917, coming up from Egypt through Gaza to Jerusalem. From that point on, um, it was under military rule of the British in the first instance, and then it came to be under mandate rule, which we'll go on to the next part. But the important thing is, Britain knew this was going to happen. They could get that uh, the Ottoman Empire was going to collapse in this area. And so started making plans for um, the future. 
but they were completely different and contradictory plans for different people. So the first one is uh, the Sykes-Picot Agreement. So you might have heard of this. This was an agreement between the British and French foreign ministers in 1916. We know about it because after the Russian Revolution, it was, it was secret. It was made open. It was uh, people allowed people to see it. People often say this established the borders of the states in the Middle East. It didn't. That is not true. But what it did do was establish the idea that Britain and France should control zones of influence. France in Syria and Lebanon, Britain in Iraq, uh, northern Saudi Arabia, southern part of Palestine, and a kind of middle buffer zone which would contain Jerusalem, basically. So the principle being these colonial powers, without asking anyone, didn't go and ask the Palestinians or the Syrians or the Saudis, what do you think about us controlling your country? Because they probably have said, no, we don't want to do that. Um, divided it up between the two of them in principle, not in the actuality of the borders, but in principle. That was followed by, of course, um, or the Hussein McMahon correspondence, which was between the Sharif Hussein, so the leader or the kind of monarch of Mecca and Medina, so the, the Muslim holy places, the leader of the Arab revolt. Of, if you've seen Lawrence of Arabia, he's in that. So this kind of movement of tribes essentially to attack the Ottomans in the rear. As a reward or an encouragement for that, McMahon, who was the ruler of Egypt at the time, basically, or the British High Commissioner in Egypt, um, essentially promised this dynasty, so not people, but this monarch and his family, control of an Arab kingdom that would run from essentially the Sinai Peninsula to possibly the Gulf, ill-defined area, with some exceptions, it says in the text, west of Aleppo, whatever that means. Um, so a kind of hazy promise. And then the final one, which is very well known, I think John will maybe speak a bit about the man who came up with it, um, the Balfour Declaration. So the Balfour Declaration, and I shall look at the text because it's quite important, was made by the Foreign Secretary, Lord Arthur Balfour, who incidentally was from Edinburgh, or from Haddington, and he was also the Chancellor of Edinburgh University for um, decades. The Balfour Declaration stated, His Majesty's Government shall look with favour upon the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities. Notice that they're not considered to have a national home. They are reduced to the status of communities. In Palestine, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I mean, why would they do this? It was a war. So this is the First World War as the context for this. As a strategic move, Britain or British policymakers thought that having this kind of colony, essentially, in the Middle East would make a, a statelet that would always be dependent on Britain. And this was expressed by Sir Ronald Storrs, who was the first governor of Jerusalem, so he was not a marginal figure, when he described the planned settlement as a little loyal Jewish Ulster in a sea of potentially hostile Arabs. Um, again, Winston Churchill, 1920, at the time of the San Remo negotiations stated, a Jewish state under the protection of the crown would from every point of view be beneficial and would be especially in harmony with the truest interests of the British Empire. Um, Chaim Weizmann, so the first president of Israel, leading, really leading Zionist figure, states in his uh, memoirs, what we wanted was a protectorate. A Jewish Palestine would be a safeguard to England, in particular in respect to the Suez Canal. So it's important to understand that this is not being done out of some kind of notion of the welfare of the Jewish people. Balfour was quite anti-Semitic in that he had pushed forward legislation designed to stop Jewish immigration to Britain in 1905. Um, and then you can look at what, um, in the very same article, Churchill has to say about why Britain should support uh, a Jewish state or national homeland, where he says it would be a counterweight to the Russian Revolution and to Trotsky's schemes of worldwide communistic state under Jewish domination. 
So exactly these kind of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories that flow around the world today, expressed by the people who are kind of putting this declaration out there. It's important to understand that, I think. Um, this, of course, is then followed and in contradiction to the 14 points of President Wilson. So President Woodrow Wilson presented this idea of national self-determination in Europe, it should be stated, in Europe, um, as the reason why there had been conflict or these multinational empires that had imprisoned their nationalities. This is an idea that's behind the foundation of the League of Nations, as part of which there was an establishment of the idea of mandates. So mandates um, were to take over by the victorious powers in the First World War, the territories of the losers. They divided them up into several categories. Palestine was a class A mandate, which meant it was supposedly more ready for self-government. The idea being that Britain is supposed to make the Palestinians able to govern themselves. Now, there's a big problem with this, which is the Palestinians were already governing themselves. They didn't need Britain to tell them how to do it. Um, it's based on a, a deeply racist idea that was expressed at Balf by Balfour at the San Remo conference, which established the mandates and incorporated the Balfour Declaration into the Palestine mandates as part of the legal foundation. But he said in a private letter to Lord Curzon that we do not propose even to go through the form of consulting the wishes of the present inhabitants. Zionism is of far profounder import than the desires and prejudices of the 700,000 Arabs who now inhabit that ancient land. Again, echoed by Chaim Weizmann, at the same time said, and I apologize for the colonial language, but this is the original text. Uh, the British have told us that there are some hundreds of thousands of Negroes, but the matter is of no consequence. So this is the underlying world of thought that can make this kind of thing happen. And on the basis of the mandate, you could get the establishment of the Yishuv, or I should say the new Yishuv. So not the old Jewish community, Yishuv means community, which were indigenous and already living in Palestine, but the new Yishuv of the settlement, which I think John, touch on. Okay. Could I, could I just ask a, a quick question, Jamie? So you, you mentioned at the beginning that you consider the uh, Palestinians to be the indigenous population to this land. Um, how do you define indigenous? They were living there. They're living there, it's obvious. I mean, if somebody was to come to, let's say that somebody was to go from Wales now and say to people living in London, well, we used to live here, you know. The Cumbric peoples were living here until uh, whenever, 800 AT. You have to leave. It would be absurd. There's no point in even, I think, using this notion of uh, ethnic ties to land. The Palestinians were simply the people who were living in Palestine when it was colonized. That's all we need to know. John, do you share that same opinion? Um. I, I agree with every word there. What I don't know is whether there are any academic definitions of the word indigenous. Um, it's not something I've looked into, but I think in terms of, you know, that is that is straightforward. Um, one thing I that uh, one thing we've got to think of, of course, and I think you're going to call on me to talk about Zionism in a moment, aren't you? Um, well, maybe I should save it for then, but. You know, the question is, there, in international law, there is no definition of what constitutes a people. There's a lot in international law about what a state is, but there is nothing about a people or a nation. And so when in an international legal text the word people appears, you can only tell, out, tell what it means from the particular context in which it occurs. And if we're talking about the people of shall we say, I don't want to get into controversies about this, but people between the Mediterranean Sea and the River Jordan, shall we just take that as a geographical unit at the time of 1918, at the end of the First World War, at the time of the end of the Ottoman Empire? There were, the, the people who were inhabiting that land is something that we could discuss what was meant. And I would 
And I think the an important point to mention here is that today we think very much of Islamism in its in various forms, uh, moderate, extreme, and so on, when we think about the Arab world. But at that time, Arab nationalism was secular, militantly secular. The, the, um, the Jews who were indigenous to Palestine, and um, Jamie didn't say anything about this, and I don't know if you agree, but I suspect you do. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt that there has always there have always been Jews living in Palestine. You know, this is the whatever happened in 78 AD did not get rid of the entire Jewish community there. Uh, there were Jews there. There was another revolt in AD 130, we know. And there's much evidence to show this, you know, archaeological evidence of synagogues and so on. But were they a separate people from the other people inhabiting Palestine, apart from the settlers who'd come to Europe from Europe, who I'm going to be talking about in a minute, they were Arabic speaking, they were Arab in culture. And um, Jamie also mentioned the 1840 Damascus blood libel. And he mentioned that it was something that came from, um, was started by some some Catholic missionaries. Um, you said were Italian. Sorry, I may have got that wrong. Well, I think some of them were, I think, I think there was also a French consul. French, it was the French consul, Italian missionaries, I think. Yeah, it was an Italian missionary who was murdered. Yes, that's right. Uh, but there was an anti-Semitic French consul in Damascus, and he is the guy who kicked it all off. Now, one of the shames, and I'm a Christian myself, but one of the shameful things in Christian history, of course, is Christian anti-Semitism towards the Jews. And the blood libel, um, the idea that in some way Jews have a secret ritual in which they kill a Christian child to reenact the death of Jesus in some horribly perverted satanic ritual. That lie actually originated in medieval England. Though it seems to be based on something taken from the book of Josephus, but that's that's detail we needn't go into. But if I could just come back to a, a previous point that you made, because you had said that that might confuse some people. You had said that there were some Jews that were indigenous to the the land, but then also that uh, Palestinians were the indigenous people to that land. That may confuse a, a few people in the audience. So can you? Great. We're having a discussion under rules of freedom of speech. I don't care if people are confused. We can sort the confusion out by free and objective discussion. Okay? So please take me up on that if you want to at any point. But sorry, it's important that I finish that very long sentence I was saying, or my point will, you'll only have half my point and you'll get the wrong end of the stick. The point is that... Um, the blood libel is an exclusively Christian thing. And in, I'm sorry to say it has to be exclusively Christian because it's only Christians who believe that Christ died on Calvary and rose from the dead. Muslims believe, and this is stated in the Quran, that Jesus was not crucified. Ergo, therefore, you cannot have a Muslim blood libel because there would be no sense in Jews conducting such a ritual. Do you take my point? And that's a very important point, I think, for people to know. Um, so the, the forms of Christian anti-Semitism, of European anti-Semitism, can I now get on to Zionism? more questions Please, for, for Jamie about the Ottoman Empire. I also want to Could, take Jamie up on one point, which I'd forgotten about. Certainly, but I just wanted to say that your last question about people being confused about there being indigenous Jews in Palestine, that's only a problem if you think that there's a contradiction between being a Jew and being Palestinian, and there isn't. Sure. Um, 
So, in fact, of the other thing to remember is this category of national identity, which we're conflating with religious identity here, and we shouldn't, is recent. It didn't really exist at this time, and it didn't exist for Jews or Muslims, Christians, anyone. So there were lots of religious communities speaking the same language, basically, in this area, as there were across the Middle East. But there was no notion of a, a nationality that they could have. Um, there were many people who came and went from the Holy Land, or whatever you want to call it, and they established, in some cases, uh, religious communities. So there were a lot of Jewish rabbinical communities in kind of the holy cities, Hebron, uh, Tiberius, uh, Safad, um, as well as people who'd just always been there. So another thing to remember is there's another group of, so we can call it Israelite religion or a related religion to Judaism, the Samaritans, who've always lived in this area. They are, the, in fact, the descendants of the kingdom of, or the, that's where the kingdom of Israel was. They are now, they are a Palestinian group. In fact, they have representation on the Palestinian National Council. So it's not a contradiction, basically. So I, I want to ask you just uh, a couple questions about mm -hmm. the things you mentioned in uh, the presentation. Um, the, the first is, so in the 1834 Peasant Revolt, um, I think some people are going to be confused by the fact that it was against the Egyptians, considering uh, we're talking about the Ottoman Empire here, the Turkish uh, empire. So can you explain that? And then also, can you explain the uh, impact of the peasant revolt in 1834 on the shaping of the uh, collective Palestinian national identity? Yeah, sure. So at this time, in the 1830s, the Ottomans did not control Palestine, or let's call it the Levant. So Muhammad Ali was a, he was actually Albanian. He was an Ottoman military officer who took over Egypt after it was invaded by France in 1800. If you've seen the film Napoleon recently, he, goes to, that's, he went to Egypt. And so Muhammad Ali tried to establish a kind of modernizing national state on the French model in Egypt, and then to take over bits of the Ottoman Empire until that made Britain and France too angry, basically, and they stopped it. So he was in control. Egypt was in control at this time. The local landowners and, you know, it's kind of local elites, I suppose you would say, opposed Muhammad Ali and they encouraged people to revolt, which went much further than they wanted it to go. Um, but it's the beginning of, I wouldn't say necessarily a Palestinian national consciousness, but you begin to see a kind of reciprocal idea that these areas around of Syria, basically great, greater Syria, might need to do something like Muhammad Ali was doing in Egypt. Mm. Okay. Uh, and then the second question I had was, so Palestinians are, are largely Arabs, correct? Yeah, whatever that means. I mean, they speak Arabic. Palest Arabic is the Palestinian national language. And the Ottomans was a, a Turkish empire. No. So this again is, uh, this is, this is, this is a problem. So we live in a world where we think that there are things called nations. And we think these things are called nations because they speak languages that are particular to that nation. And then people go, well, you're in Scotland, you're speaking English, which points out that that doesn't always work. Um, so, and that these nations must have states. This is incredibly new in human history and it doesn't work for this time period. So it's important to avoid what I would say is like the Flintstones model of history, where you think that everyone in the past is exactly the same as us and they went around in cars driven by dinosaurs. So this didn't have the notion of what an Arab meant. In fact, at this time, if you said Arab, it would mean a Bedouin. It would mean somebody lives in the desert. Uh, people spoke Arabic. It's irrelevant what language they spoke. They cared about religious distinctions. So there were Muslims, there were Christians, there were Jews, and Muslim subsects as well as other sects. So the idea that we have now of nationalism, where there's a language, Arabic, which imposes a national identity, Palestinian or otherwise, um, is new. And because Palestinians were reacting to colonization in the late 19th century, they were part of the Arab nationalist movement, which 
wanted to unify Arabic speakers without distinction of religion. So John mentioned they're generally secular. So Christians and Muslims together. Um, so that's when you get the idea of Arab nationalism. To speak about now, yes, Arabic is the language that Palestinians generally speak. But there are also religious and linguistic minorities. There are people who, Syriac, for example, Aram, which we know is like Aramaic, language of Jesus, basically, is still used in some religious communities. Armenian, the equation of Palestinian Arab Muslim is not, it's not exact. It's not like that. And, and what was the, the, the primary cause of that movement toward uh, Arab nationalism toward the end of the Ottoman Empire? Uh, well, the, comp the idea of nationalism, first of all, hadn't existed before. So it came from the experience of seeing in Europe bits of the Ottoman Empire that began to um, establish independence in Europe. So Greece, for example, key one in the eight, around this time, 1820s, 1830s. It's notable just talking about language. The Greeks of that time did not know that they were Greek. It was unfamiliar to them. They called themselves Rum, which meant Christians, Christians as opposed to the Muslims who were ruling them, who spoke Turkish, or what? Well, they spoke the language that made the thing that we now call Turkish. Um, there began to be a kind of domino effect in the Christian provinces of the Ottoman Empire, so Bulgaria, uh, Romania, these other areas becoming split off, which inspired similar movements in the Arab world where people became aware of a linguistic rather than a religious difference. Um, especially after what was called the Young Turk Revolution, this was happening amongst Turks as well. So the developing idea of Turkish kind of national consciousness to fight against or defend the empire against foreign powers to adopt a national identity. So in 1908, there was a revolution or a kind of, yeah, a revolution we can call it by, led by army officers, mainly Turkish, Turkish speaking, actually a lot of them were of other, other backgrounds. <laughs> I mean, it's, you, cannot, you cannot impose these categories on this time. Um, it's the clear thing to remember. But as a result of that revolution, you began to get both more freedom and political organization and the idea of nationhood. So that is really the background. Okay. Um, yes. Could I just add a couple of things? At the very beginning, you know, nationalism is something that develops and goes through several stages. No, the path to nationhood is not unique in every single case. You know, they don't all go in exactly the same direction, but things gradually happen. And one of the very interesting and maybe tragic things about early Arab nationalism is it was very good at uniting Muslims and Christians. And Christians were a very substantial minority. Um, they were 18% of Greater Syria, probably, something like 15% of Egypt, and so on, you know, the Copts. But it's also very interesting, and I think this point should be made, is that there are one or two Jewish figures in the early Arab nationalist movements. Um, Egyptian nationalism was then separate from Arab nationalism, but there was quite a key figure, I think, James Sanua, mm. also known as Yaqub Sanua in, in his native Arabic, who was an Egyptian Jew and um, was one of the... He, he, he plays a very interesting role in Egypt in the 1870s and 80s and was... And had to leave the country on, you know, because it was going to be topped by the ruler, because the ruler did not like nationalist agitation of this sort. And what's one of the fascinating things about him is that he he was an educated man, as you can imagine, but he managed to mix the language of the Quran with earthy Egyptian colloquial dialect in. Uh, in magazine articles and cartoons he published. He was actually the first cartoonist in, in an Arab country in the modern sense, um, which was used to stir up troops who were fighting to prevent a British invasion in 1882. So he's a very interesting figure. He died in 1912. But of course, once Zionism came on the scene, this became very difficult because what Zionism did I'm not quite talking about Zionism yet, 
was it opened a huge gulf between Jews, between all Jews ultimately, and the, everybody else who spoke Arabic. Um, the other point I wanted to mention, you mentioned the Hussein McMahon correspondence, and you implied it wasn't clear. Um, there is a very good book that only came out this year by a man called Peter Shambrook, mm -hmm. called Policy of Deceit. And he has gone into the, he's actually spent a life's work dissecting the Sykes-Picot correspondence and how it was interpreted. And I think his book, which is published by One World Academic, shows pretty conclusively, I think it's now very hard to argue that Britain did not promise Palestine would be included in the Arab state. The name of the book? Policy of deceit. Policy of deceit. Okay, well, I have a few more questions, but I think we should circle back and right now go to uh, the hot topic of Zionism. Right, thank you. Um, Zionism, as a word, appeared in the 1880s, Zionismus in German, where it began. And basically what Zionism is, it is a form of Jewish nationalism. It is the main form of Jewish nationalism. There are other forms, but I don't think any of them really survive today. And um, this is also part of the same thing, the same phenomenon of nationalism spreading as an idea. And of course, the 19th century was the great age of European nationalism. You had the unification of Germany and Italy in about 1870. Um, and you also had a little bit, religion was beginning to retreat as the, as the dominant um, spiritual and, and intellectual glue holding the population together. And um, secular ideas were coming along. Liberté, égalité, fraternité from the French Revolution, the ideals of the Enlightenment, and so on. And Jews, like everybody else, were exposed to this and took part in this. And in the case of Jews, what happened was Jewish emancipation was proceeding, starting with the French Revolution and so on. Um, it was uneven. There were some cases where the position of Jews was dire like in the Russian Empire, which was where I think maybe an absolute majority of European Jews probably lived. But the same th but these were international phenomena, what I've been talking about. And Jews began basically to leave the ghetto. Quite a lot of them turned their back on religion. A lot of 19th century Jews found the Judaism with, with, with which they had grown up, sort of, uh, they, they saw of it a, a relic of the past. Many of them wanted to shun it. Um, some of them converted to Christianity, basically because they hoped it would make them more um, assimilated. Uh, for instance, um, there was a very famous man in the 18th century called Moses Hess, known as the German Socrates, who was an Orthodox Jew. And no one really cared about the fact that he was Jewish, I think. Although he, I think he did talk about the hardships Jews faced as a minority. But his, every one of his single, of his children, and I think he had quite a number, I can't remember the figure, became a Lutheran Christian. And one of them was the father of the composers Felix and Fanny Mendelssohn whose music, of course, is well known today. Um, at the same time, you had new scientific ideas coming along, some of them very dangerous, things that we now see as clearly repellent. I'm talking about some of the 19th century ideas of race and racism, um, these theories of the Count of Gob de Gobino and so on. And... Um, this could give a, an extra way of turning Jews into the other. In medieval Christian Europe, they had been the other on relig for religious reasons. But now, as a lot of countries began to think of them, their people as a race, um, the question was, where do minorities fit into this? 
most Jews ultimately came from somewhere else. Um, it might have been from Sephardic Spain before 1492, but mo more often than not, in the overwhelming majority of cases, it was from Eastern Europe, from the, what was then the empire of the Tsars and the eastern bits of the Austro-Hungarian empire like Galicia, where Jews had their own language, a closely related to German, but written in the Hebrew alphabet, known as Yiddish. And um, as Jews assimilated, many of them began to wonder, are we really succeeding in being regarded as equal citizens? People still look down on us. People still despise us. People don't really accept us as being one of us. There was a there was some very nasty anti-Semitic um, politicians as democracy came along, people who could win elections. And this happened notably in Vienna. And there was a guy, I think, called von Schoenerer, who was an anti-Semitic politician. And he had a famous line. He would say to a Jew, now, don't you worry. We decide who a Jew is. Doesn't mean you, my dear friend. It's just the others. And of course, we're seeing this mutatis mutandis, if you'll excuse a Latin expression, in today's world um, of people demonizing the outsider. And Jews were very vulnerable to that in late 19th century Europe. And there were, obviously, I can't go through everything tonight. So I'm just going to speak about a very few people. But the first one was. Theodor Herzl, who was the man who founded political Zionism. And he um, thought assimilation isn't working. He was convinced of that by the election of an anti-Semitic mayor in Vienna, and also perhaps by the Dreyfus case. Um, what we have to do is think of ourselves as a people, as a nation. He wasn't necessarily set on Palestine being the homeland of the Jews. But he found, as soon as he went to Eastern Europe, to the land of the Tsars, where the vast majority of Jews left, lived, that they, um, they believed this was the land that belonged to the Jews. And this was a belief held by people who'd never been there, who'd only read about it, who knew it in their religious texts. And of course, when Zionism became a form of nationalism for Jewish people, they often conflated religious and nationalist things. So, for instance, one of the major Jewish festivals is the Festivals of Light, Light Hanukkah, which is to celebrate the reconsecration of the temple in Jerusalem. And an eminent Zionist said, uh, a man known as Asher Ginsberg, also known as Ahad Ha'am, he said, well, really, this should be thought of as a national festival for Jews. It was about reconsecrating our most important national monument, the temple. And so many of these people who became Zionists had drifted away from religion. Um, Herzl, for instance, didn't have his son circumcised. And he shocked the chief rabbi of Vienna, who paid him a courtesy call one uh, December, probably asking him, isn't it about time you came along to synagogue, and found um, Herzl setting up a Christmas tree, um, which was a definite no-no in the eyes of the chief rabbi of Vienna in 1895. And the other big thing for the Jews was the um, revival of the Hebrew, sorry, the other big thing for the Zionists, not the Jews, was the revival of the Hebrew language as a national um, language for the Jews. Now, another form of uh, Jewish nationalism that hasn't survived called Bundism wanted to, wanted to big up Yiddish instead, because that is what most Jews spoke. But Ahad Ha'am and many others were afraid that Jews were just melting away. Ahata Am gave up religion. He became an atheist, in fact, 
but he was outraged when his daughter married a non-Jew. And despite all the repression of Tsarist Russia and the horrible situation of Jews there, many Jews were assimilating even there. As education began to spread, children began to speak Russian as well as Yiddish and began to abandon Yiddish sometimes and were not bothered to learn Hebrew. Now, yes, another place where um, anti-Semitism was rife was Vienna. And there what was happening was there was a kind of squeezed middle. Um, Austrians, um, ordinary people, small shopkeepers perhaps, who felt vulnerable because there was a new department store opening owned by a Jewish family, while at the same time there were refugees from the East who might be freezing to death on the streets in winter, but made their living at, by peddling. And that, of course, also undercut the corner shop. So you had the growth in, um, in anti-Semitism, and that was a big factor in the growth of Zionism. And Herzl actually believed that all Jews would ultimately emigrate to Palestine to set up a state there, or they would assimilate. Ahat Ha'am had a different idea. He saw, he saw Zionism as creating a kind of spiritual center for the Jewish people in Palestine, which would be a light to the whole Jewish community all over the world and would help revive the community everywhere. Now, Zionism was very much a minority thing among Jews, but it gradually grew, and particularly after the Balfour Declaration in 1917, which has already been mentioned by Jamie, but it only probably became a majority um, view of Jews after the start of the Second World War. Uh, as people realized just how appalling Hitler was. Now, the facts of the Holocaust only became irrefutable, I think, in late 1942, because the, you know, the Van Zee Conference was in early 1942, and I think it was only through the Polish resistance that the news of what was going on seeped out later that year. But everyone knew already well before Van Zee how horrific the anti-Semitism of the Nazis was. So I've told you about two types of Zionist. The Herzlian Zionist, who wanted to establish a state in Palestine. Um, Ahad Ha'am's Zionism, which wanted it to be a spiritual centre. But even ha -ha Ahad Ha'am believed that Palestine should acquire a majority Jewish population. And here you automatically have a problem because it was all this was predicated on the people of Palestine not having a right of self-determination themselves. And that is actually what has led to the conflict, if, co if conflict is the right word to use. Many people think it's the wrong word because we're not take, talking about a fight between equals, are we? But, you know, there, maybe at an earlier stage it was a bit more equal, but that's not, that's not the point. Um, I think there is no doubt that the Zionist project made war inevitable. Um, there were two Zionist Jews, though, who had a rather different perspective and who are quite well-known figures even today. One of them, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about them very briefly. One of them is Judah Magnus, who was the first chancellor of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He was the first native-born Californian to be ordained a rabbi. He was born in 1877, and in 1907, he went on a tour by horseback of the Holy Land, and he and his companions got to the top of Mount Hermon, and he looked south and he said how he wanted to possess all this land for the Jewish people. But he was a man of tremendous principle, tremendous moral integrity, 
and he came to see the problems. And when the Balfour Declaration was um, came out, he was uh, he was very opposed to it. He said he th- he said that it would impair the Zionist movement's spiritual influence, and he observed, as Jamie has already mentioned, that it was primarily for the benefit of the British Empire, and he commented. It is in the nature of every imperialism to go back on its promises if it, is, it seems necessary to its existence or to the strength of the empire to do this. Now, he was a pacifist. And in the First World War, he'd done a lot of work to aid the Jewish communities of Eastern Europe in the war-torn area between the Russian and Germans who were fighting over that, that bit. Um, Later on, however, he came to realize that the only way to confront Hitler was by fighting him. And so he went back on his pacifism. But he was very, very opposed to the declaration of a Jewish state. And when the Biltmore program in 1942, um, this was, I think, before the news of the Holocaust became definite. But as I said, people knew how desperate the plight of Jews was in in Nazi Germany and the Nazi-occupied countries. Um, There was a declaration um, at a place in the the States called Biltmore, where it said that the aim should be to to construct a Jewish commonwealth in Palestine. And he said, now the the, um, Balfour Declaration had been well, it's a real case of weasel words. Um, you can interpret it in all sorts of different ways. What is meant by a national home, for instance? Um, but you can interpret it in many other ways as well as that. And um, But the Biltmore project, if you like, made it absolutely clear that the Zionist movement was determined to, con- to take control of Palestine at the expense of the Palestinian Arabs. And he believed that was wrong. And he died in October 1948, just after the creation of the State of Israel, uh, after the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, which began well before the declaration of the state, by the way. And he said, and this is in the last bit he ever published before he died, it is unfortunate that the very men who would point to the tragedy of the Jewish displaced persons as the chief argument for immigration into Palestine should now be ready, as far as the world knows, to create an additional category of displaced persons in the Holy Land. And that, I'm sorry to say, lies ultimately behind Gaza today, because I think two-thirds or three-quarters of the population of Gaza are the original refugees who were displaced so that Israel could be created or their very numerous descendants. The other man I will talk briefly about, who was an ally and close friend of um, Magnus, was Martin Buber, who people studying philosophy may have come across separately. But who he also had started off as a Zionist, He worked for Herzl for about six months, but then something disturbed him in Herzl. I'm not quite sure what it was. And they parted company and he left the Zionist movement. But he he was very disturbed again by the Balfour Declaration. And he said, well, he actually turned everybody else's thinking on their head because he said, what the Zionists are doing with the Balfour Declaration is you are assimilating to the dominant dogma of the century, the unholy dogma of the sovereignty of nations, which assumes that one's nation is answerable only to itself. And so he and Judah Magnus both gave evidence opposing the um, partition of Palestine in 1947 and were hated by 
David Ben-Gurion and the leaders of the Zionist movement at that time. And um, it's, it's a very, very tragic thing that I think they weren't listened to because they both taught that what should happen and the only way the Zionist goal could be achieved was by the consent and getting the proper cooperation of the Palestinian Arabs. And I think I'm going to trespass onto James. I, I won't talk. I'll, well, I'll just mention it, but then I'll hand over to you perhaps. Um, one of the things the British mandate was meant to do was give self-determination to the Palestinian people. The Palestinians may not have wanted Britain there in the first place. They thought they could rule themselves. Thank you very much. And incidentally, there was a, an attempt to set up a united kingdom of greater Syria in 1919-1920. And that had its own parliament, which actually included a, a Jewish member from Damascus, Yusuf Lef, Lefkado. Um, and the man who would have been its king, Prince Faisal, made it very clear that for an Arab nationalist, as far as he were concerned, he said, the Arabs were Arabs before Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. And whoever sets this discord between Arab and Jew, or Muslim and Jew, I can't remember which he said, is not an Arab. There is a very, very different model of what could have happened. But of course, now we're down in the territory of the might have been of history. Um, but Article 22 of the Covenant of the League of Nations made it very clear the Palestinian people were entitled to political self-determination and independence. And there was an obligation in the Palestine mandate to, in to establish those representative institutions which Britain did not fulfill. By contrast, they did in Jordan, they did in, the French did in Lebanon and Syria, and the British did in Iraq. And all those were mandated territories where there was the same obligation. But Palestine was denied this. And that again is one of the main problems that had led to where we are today. If I could... Thank you, uh, John, for that very nuanced and uh, detailed discussion of, of Zionism. That was great. If I could just ask ask one question, and then we'll move to uh, Jamie in the interest of time. Um, so Theodore Herschel is considered the uh, the father of political Zionism, correct? What was the primary purpose of... Uh, because you mentioned that he wasn't a particularly religious Jew. Uh, what was the primary purpose of him uh, creating the Zionist conference, moving the uh, Zionist cause along? What was the primary purpose he was trying to fulfill? Was it solely to create a, uh, a Jewish state? Was it colonialism? Was it to alleviate the suffering of Jews in Europe? What was the primary purpose of the political Zionist project? Um, well, if you'd asked him, he would have said it is to, alleviate, to alleviate the dreadful suffering of the Jews. That's, that is what he would definitely have said. And he believed that um, by establishing a Jewish state of some sort, um, it, it, it might well have been part of a wider federation. Personally, I think he had something... The, these are, we're talking pre-First World War here, when Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa were already politically independent of the British Crown, but all had the, the you know they they had they were all completely self-governing, but they all had the um, the King of England or the Queen of England as their monarch, and they were they they, they were umbilically tied together in many ways. And I think my personal view is that Herzl saw something like that happening for a Jewish Palestine, a predominantly Jewish Palestine, uh, within a reformed Ottoman Empire, or maybe as a, something like another British dominion, or even a Germanian dominion in a similar way for Germany. Um, 
What Herzl did not do was address the um, issue of the fact that Palestine was not an empty land. And he, there, are quite, there are quite a few um, rather, I think, um, racist um, tropes that you can accuse him of having. For instance, he believed that um, Jews should sell their property in Europe and this would all be done as a fair, at a fair market price so they could all move to Palestine. But on the other hand, in Palestine himself, at least this, this is what he says in his novel Alt Neuland, Old New Land, um, which is a fictionalised, idealised uh, uh, story of how the state might be founded. Uh, he said, we had a very shrewd land agent, a Sephardi, who spoke good Arabic and Greek. And we kept the idea of the Jewish state secret. So he went around buying up land so that the Arab vendors were unaware that the land was likely to increase in price as soon as the Jewish state was established. Now, notice how he thought the Arab vendors in um, Palestine should be treated and how he thought uh, Jewish property should be sold at a fair open market price in Europe. And it's very hard not to say, um, well, isn't there something a bit racist there? Um, he also, for instance, only went to Palestine once and talked about how he travelled through an Arab blighted countryside um, and things like that. You know, it's uh, you can say to some extent this were, these were the thoughts of a man of his time, but um, if the you know if 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 late nineteenth century Europe was racist, the same applied to its Jewish as well as to its non-Jewish population, is what I would say. It, if he wasn't so such a religious Jew, why was he so tied to a Jewish national homeland in Palestine, or did he have? other ideas about other places where Jews could establish a national home? He personally would have been perfectly happy to. Within a month of his very sudden conversion to Zionism, he wrote in his diary that he thought we'd find somewhere in South America and we would be able to spirit the uh, indigenous population. I don't know if he used the word indigenous, but and it, it was in German anyway. Um, uh, you know, uh, we would spirit the, the penniless population across the border by refusing them opportunities to work and things. Um, but he soon found, after he set up his sorry, after he set up his his Zionist Congress, that the over the majority of the members came from the Pale of Settlement, the Empire of the Tsars, and they um, wanted. They said it's Palestine or nowhere. And so the so-called Uganda scheme got nowhere. But he also thought of El Arish and the Sinai Peninsula, Cyprus, um, Mesopotamia, what's now Libya, um, even apparently the Congo, Mozambique and Madagascar. You know, and other Zionists, there was another Zionist leader a little before him called uh, Leon Penska, who some of you may have heard of, who was exactly the same. And um, again, you can find the same sort of racist tropes there, which were common to the Europeans of the day. For instance, he says the difference between, uh, you know, Jews are oppressed. Yes, he also said, you know, he also said black people are oppressed. But he said, but the Jews come from an advanced race. You know. and, and, and what was, I mean, what was his plan for establishing uh, this Jewish state? Was it just go in guns blazing and, and conquer? Or was it immigration? Or or was it through using the British and other uh, imperial powers? I mean, how- he, he, saw it, he saw it as something to be done by diplomatic means, supported by the powers of the day. Um, it would re require money. And the mechanism he saw for doing it was a chartered company. Now, I don't know if how many of you have studied um, European expansion or whatever you like to call it. I'm trying to try and use a neutral term. But an awful lot of European expansion across the oceans 
was done in a semi-privatized form of, of, of uh, imperialism by um, private companies, chartered companies. Uh, the most famous ones for us are probably the East India Company. And there was also the British South Africa Company set up by Cecil Rhodes, of whom Herzl was a great admirer, by the way, um, that, that basically colonized what's now Zimbabwe and Zambia and Malawi. Um, and the idea, one of the ideas in international law at the time was that companies like this could have sovereignty over land. And I think he envisaged something similar in, um, in Palestine. Getting back to anti-Semitic tropes, by the way, he told the Ottoman Sultan the Jews would use their command of money to discharge the um, Ottoman national debt, which was crippling in exchange for being given Palestine. Mm. Okay, well, I, I, again, I have more questions, but I think in the interest of time, we should turn to uh, Jamie again. Right. So, <clears throat> as we've heard, um, Zionism was developing as a nationalist movement, primarily in, in Europe. And so it meant moving people from there. Mainly, there were, there were some people who came from Yemen, small number, and Morocco, small number in this period, but basically European immigration, which could only really be achieved under this thing, the British mandate. Because Britain, in fact, <clears throat> as I said, incorporated the Balfour Declaration into this structure. And as a result, did not, in fact, create the kind of institutions that there was, there was a parliament in Transjordan, for example, which was split off from the Palestine mandate, so what's now the Kingdom of Jordan, in 1926. Um, similarly, institutions in, in Syria and Iraq, whether we think they were really independent or not, there was some sort of thing going on that wasn't happening here. The first so-called high commissioner, so the ruler of the Palestine mandate, or the chief executive, was a guy called Herbert Samuel, Sir Herbert Samuel, he's a former British cabinet minister. I believe he was the first practicing Jew to be in the cabinet. Maybe. No, Herbert Montague. Montague. But one of a few, anyway. So it was an early kind of pathbreaker. But he was, he was also, he did believe in Zionism. So he had circulated papers around the cabinet when he was in it and during the war, promoting the idea of a Jewish national home and settlement. So he's now in charge of this mandate. The pal local Palestinian kind of notables, understandably, thought that perhaps uh, this is not entirely neutral kind of uh, situation. Um, and this was confirmed by the first kind of legislative acts or the kind of orders of the mandate, which were to set up um, something called the Jewish Agency, which kind of in executive institution that basically would be by and for the, the Jewish community, the Yishuv, which at this time was not that large. So John's mentioned how most, you know, Zionism is minority current amongst European Jews. Predominantly people fleeing their oppression in Europe went to America or other, other Western countries mil in their millions. Probably about... 80,000, fewer than 100,000 people emigrated to Palestine in the period between 1880 and 1920. So it wasn't huge, but it was given this kind of role as basically running the country for the Jewish part of the population. Also, the, the mandate explicitly uh, allowed Jewish immigration or Jewish immigrants to gain Palestinian nationality. So officially, Palestine was a state in waiting. You could have a Palestinian identity document. You can find these. So people like Yitzhak Shamir, um, other Zionist leaders, they were technically, as far as international law was concerned, Palestinians. Giving the Jewish agency or kind of this um, right or principle that Jewish immigrants should be 
basically uh, acquire this nationality without any uh, just turning up um, meant immigration could increase vastly. And then the third thing was to make it more difficult for Palestinian uh, cultivators, peasants, to um, occupy unoccupied lands, which traditionally they had the right to do under kind of Ottoman land tenure, and instead limit what they could do to encourage the sale of those lands to the Jewish National Fund, which was the part of the kind of Zionist organization that was buying up land. So this provoked a reaction, which was also part of really other uprisings or clashes that were happening across the region in Iraq and in Egypt and Syria as well, where there were a series of riots, basically, or attacks, mass uh, outbursts in, first of all, um, Jerusalem, so Nabi Musa, Prophet Moses, uh, birthday kind of event, where many or several Jews were killed. And then following that year in Jaffa, it was, this is a very strange incident. So it was actually what happened was a group of communists composed of both Jews and Arabs clashed with a group of uh, labor Zionists on the May Day rally. So Zionism was divided at this time now into broadly kind of left or socialist grouping, the labor Zionists associated with David Ben-Gurion and the right wing part, the revisionists associated with a guy called Zev Jabotinsky. So there was a fight between these two groups, not, not Palestinians. The Palestinians didn't know what was going on, thought they were being attacked, and all hell kind of broke loose. With the result, again, that there were many Jews were killed, and also many Palestinians, many Arabs were then also killed. So these kind of, this was new, like specifically attacking kind of Jewish businesses or visibly Jewish people, that was new. Even in 1919, 1918, the Palestinian representatives were saying we are explicitly kind of we are not against kind of our Jewish neighbours and so on. So this is a kind of new and slightly disturbing element in it. Um, the British mandate actually began in 1923. And during that time, as I've said, the... Zionist movement was building up independent institutions. I've mentioned the Jewish agency, which basically became the executive of the state, but also military institutions, so militias like the Haganah, the labor Zionist uh, militia, building up its own society with which to replace the existing Palestinian society, which was not unaware of this. So Palestinians were developing their own um, their own national movement. There were seven congresses of Palestinian kind of national uh, leaders, which reiterated the same positions that we object to our land being taken away. We want to stop Jewish immigration. We want to have an independent Palestine. Britain just didn't, didn't listen to them, um, just did not recognize them, in fact, although they did recognize the National Assembly of the Yishuv. So this is the fundamental reason that there was this kind of, as well as the economic dispossession going on as a result of the land sales, increasing um, violence, basically, violent outburst. So which happened particularly in 1929, which we can see, I mean, there was a specific incident, which was the, the what we, people call Haram al-Sharif, the, the, or, or the, the Temple Mount, the Dome of the Rock, area in the centre of Jerusalem, which is holy to both Jews and to Muslims. So Jews believe it is the remembrant of the temple, or well it is, that is where the second temple was. Um, we're setting up kind of permanent installations for prayer, which had been rejected previously and had been said, we're not going to do this. And this resulted in these, these riots, or riots, I mean, clashes, uprising to a degree, which did have a kind of intercommunal aspect to them. So both Palestinian Christians and Muslims being killed and Jews. So particularly in Hebron, which is a very old non-Zionist Jewish community, uh, basically left as a result of this. 
So, obviously, we can see Hitler comes to power in Germany, but it wasn't just Hitler. I mean, there's a general trend towards the far right in Europe and towards, it should be noted, um, refusing asylum to the victims of those regimes. So wherever you got, and it wasn't just Germany, it was persecution of the Jews in Austria before the Anschluss, in uh, Romania and other countries. Um, wherever that happened, the neighboring countries, France, Britain, and also the US, tightened their immigration restrictions. They didn't let more people in, they let fewer people in. As a result, unsurprisingly, many Jews in Europe felt we have nowhere else to go but this one place where at least it's guaranteed where it might be safe. So there was a huge spike in um, emigration in the 1930s on the basis of the mandate allowing it and European regimes creating the need for it, while other European countries denied the right of asylum to those people. So that is really the origin basically of the, it's kind of the bedrock of the population that would fight in 1948 to establish the, the state of Israel. Um, but this led to, so we've got this economic dispossession, political exclusion going on of Palestinians. Eventually led to this huge uprising that lasted for three years between 1936 and 1939. It was a national uprising. It was mainly peasants who were fighting, led by the local traditional leadership including the guy who was actually appointed the chief religious officer, the Mufti of Jerusalem, by the British, uh, Haj Amin al-Husseini, um, who, who was genuinely, at this point, certainly anti-Semitic, kind of identified with Hitler and so on. Um, although that's, people often present that as if the Arab revolt is therefore a kind of version of Hitlerism, which it's not. It's this kind of desperate uh, uprising by a dispossessed peasant population, which was, it occupied more British troops than the whole of India in this period. This was also when the first Zionist militias really began to learn how to fight. So the Haganah, the Irgun, which was the revisionist, uh, the revisionist um, uh, militia, um, and began to crystallize the idea, which already existed of a so-called transfer so that there is no there's no way you can have these two communities in the one space i mean particularly articulated by jabotinsky um, who said every indigenous people will resist alien settlers as long as they see any hope of ridding themselves of the danger of foreign settlement this is how the arabs will behave and go on behaving so long as they possess a gleam of hope that they can prevent Palestine from becoming the land of Israel. So a turn towards the idea that you must remove that gleam of hope, which was given a boost by Britain's really uh, um, a wholesale alliance with the Yeshuv in suppressing the, the Palestinian revolt. And in fact, it was Britain, it was British troops that did the most outrageous things. Very familiar colonial tactics, collective punishment, summary execution, blowing up whole villages, um, night raids, so-called, called, going and just taking, uh, destroying a place at night. So it was Britain that taught these kind of methods that were eventually to be used, and which of course come from the long, long litany of um, colonial revolts elsewhere. It's not an accident, perhaps, that the Palestine police force and the kind of paramilitary, colonial paramilitary police force was heavily filled with people who had fought, or officers who had fought in Ireland in the, in the War of Independence, or against the War of Independence. So the Black and Tans, if you are familiar with that, uh, if you were taught about how awful they were by your father, like I was, um, <laughs> uh, they, they, a lot of them ended up in, um, in, 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 in Palestine. Um, so, as a result, two things happened. First of all, the Palestinian kind of community was crushed and had lost its, its sort of leadership, uh, which is very important in 1948. Second, Britain responded to this with uh, a kind of um, 
back and forth about how to deal with the situation because they see that this is not working. Britain can't continue its occupation. Started off with something called the Peel Commission, which recommended partition, which was eventually what would happen in 1948. A Jewish state and an Arab state. Even though the Arab Palestinians were the vast majority, that there'd be a Jewish state that would occupy an area that would have an Arab minority almost as large as the Jewish population in it. This, and a kind of, again, this idea of a neutral zone around the holy, holy uh, places. This made the revolt worse. So then Britain kind of went back on this uh, idea with the so-called White Paper of 1949. Oh. 39, yes, sorry. Slip of the tongue, 39, which envisaged an independent Palestine with restricted Jewish immigration. So that it would be restricted, I think, to 75,000 people over 10 years, which, of course, alienated the, the Zionists, who then took up their own campaign, partly against British rule, but also against Arab communities. So per the Irgun, particularly the revisionist Zionists, uh, were, were kind of attacking Arab uh, Palestinian markets and, and things like that. So I think that that's where I want to end with that one. Yeah. I um, well, thank you again. Um, there's a couple questions, points of clarification that I want to want to ask you. Uh, the first is why is it not correct to say that the all the Jews in Palestine at the time were from Europe. Uh, and yeah, well, first let's start with that. Well, they weren't. Um, so you had a population of about, it's difficult to say, maybe five to 6,000 of the old Yishuv. So the people who had been, like you've got Jewish communities all over the Middle East. It's an indigenous part of that region. Um, so towns of any size in the Arab world, Arab and Muslim world, would often have Jews in them. You had that, and you had people who'd come for religious reasons in previous centuries, making up, yeah, a few, a few thousand, maybe under 10,000. Um, they were there always. After the Zionist immigration of the 1880s onwards, you had about, I mean, maybe about 80 to 100,000 people moved to Palestine. A lot of them left. They didn't want to do this and they didn't stay. But probably you're talking about that number of those settlers in 1920, let's say. But not every single one of them came from Europe. The overwhelming majority came from Europe. But particularly in the 20s, there were some groups, especially from Yemen, which had a massive Jewish community um, in, and, and also some Iraqis, but a, f a few who came. But we're talking low thousands. It's not a vast number. Were there any distinctions between the European Jews that came and the non-European Jews in terms of their support slash zeal for the Zionist movement? Well, that's a very understudied topic. So there have been some suggestions recently of perhaps some penetration of Zionist ideas in Morocco um, and Algeria, but it's not clear. It's not, you know, they might be a few thinkers. In terms of the, the Yemenis, so they were definitely brought on religious terms. It was through the kind of rabbis, through the kind of... Uh, religious outreach. But as, as John was saying, Zionism is not primarily a religious movement, not even fundamentally a religious movement. And even in Europe, most of the religious establishment, Jewish religious establishment, opposed Zionism. And you'll see to this day, there are sm very small, but small groups of ultra-Orthodox Jews who are very anti-Zionist because they identify this nationalism as a worship of the state. And they say, we worship God, we don't worship the state. Um, and so they think it consider it blasphemous. So there wasn't a great movement of Zionism in these areas. To the where you find a lot of 
involvement of Arab Jews in politics tends to be on the left. So particularly in Egypt and Iraq, the communist parties very much, and Morocco as well actually, very many Jews were in them. Within the Jewish community though, I should have mentioned, there was a fundamental system of racist discrimination between Palestinians and Jewish settlers. In the civil service, Palestinians got paid half what Jews got paid. And as a result, or through a, a whole of the labor market, Palestinians were paid less, and there was a concerted attempt to remove them from the economy. This was why the Histradut, the trade union was established, from which Arabs were excluded. Couldn't join it until 1959. The whole point was to create what they called J Jewish labor. So exclude, which is quite, if you want to do this, that's what you should do. You know, you establish kind of the, the production is what is the key. Um, but even within the Jewish community, so there's a big, there's a big difference between the so-called Mitzrachim, or the Oriental Jews, Middle Eastern Jews, uh, and the Europeans, the Ashkenazim. Um, the Mitzrachim were looked down upon within, even within this community, and there's some evidence that maybe they were subject to these wage differentials as well. They were discriminated against as well. And if you read the, if you look at the memoirs of some of the Zionist leaders, they're very disparaging about these groups. And they say these were lower quality kind of settlers, or lower quality fighters, or this, this kind of thing, which persisted um, after the state of Israel was founded. But we're not, we're not going on to that. But it persisted. And it's part of the same I mean, it's part of the same idea. If the whole point is Arabs are blighting this land, what if you turn up and there's a bunch of people you thought were Jewish, but actually talk Arabic, they eat Arab food, they have Arab families, they dance to Arab music. They are to all intents and purposes Arabs. You're going to have the same ideas about them. And I, and I guess that really underscores why it, it wasn't like a specifically religious no. movement. No, quite the opposite. Mm. Quite the opposite. And then... Could you also talk us through uh, the specifics of the uh, first proposed solution uh, in the Appeal Commission and what exactly uh, the plans were? Yeah, so the plan was that there would be two states. I mean, it's, it's kind of, ex there's not much more to say on it than that. That there would be a, kind of the northern part, which is now around Haifa, Jaffa, Tiberias, which is kind of more fertile area where most of the Jewish settlement was, that that would be a Jewish state. And within that, there would be a Jewish majority. Um, but it wasn't a very large majority. There would still be Arabs in the Jewish state. And then this kind of bo bottom part going down into the desert, into the Negev, would be Palestinian state, Arab state, which would have most of the Arabs or the Arab Palestinians in it, most of the Palestinians in it, with some small amount of Jewish communities. In the middle, there would be a kind of band of neutral zone around Jerusalem, Bethlehem, holy places. I can't. I don't think Hebron is included in this. Although Hebron is very no, uh, for Hebron is very sacred to both Jews and Muslims, actually, as the site of purported site of the tomb of of Abraham. Um, so the holy places would be a separate area. So that was the that was the commission plan. That was the commission plan. That it made the the revolt bigger. Because, because the Palestinians thought, well, why are you giving this large chunk of our society, which has, a, until very recently, a majority of Arabs in it, to the settlers? So they felt... What was, what was the... Um, do you know like the exact percentages of which land was going to go to the Arabs and which land was going to go to... Not exactly for the Peel Commission, but I can tell you for the partition plan, which is... Um, which is basically the same idea. So it's what came out in 1948, the UN partition plan. It would be a 56% of the land would have been the Jewish state and it would have had half a million Jews in it. 
and 492,000 Arabs in it. So in a population of about roughly a million, basically equal. But one side of that population, which had arrived recently from Europe, would have a kind of supremacy in that state, which was the majority of the land. And then in the remainder, you'd have this neutral, this is why this doesn't add up to 100. You have this neutral bit around Bethlehem and Jerusalem, which again, to the Palestinians was kind of an outrage because it was, what's up to you, what you do with Jerusalem? We're not telling you what to do with London. 42% um, would be the Arab state with about 800,000 Arab Palestinians in it and 10,000 Jews. So much, much smaller ratio. There would be a really tiny minority. So I don't think these were that, this was what the, the partition plan but that was based upon the ideas of the Peel Commission. So you're saying the Peel Commission was something similar to this? Similar. It was similar. Okay. But that was revoked by Britain in 1939 with the White Paper. So the White Paper said, we're not going to do this. We're going to have an independent state of Palestine in 10 years with a basically kind of bi binational rule um, with limited Jewish immigration. So it will limit Jewish immigration to 75,000 people, and therefore there won't be a greater, uh, there won't be a Jewish majority. And that was, that was 75,000 people over the next five years? I think it was 10, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't like to be quoted on the exact figures. I think it was 15,000 a year for five years. Yeah. Total of 75,000. And, and that was from 1939 to 1944? Yes. But obviously something intervened, which was the Second World War and the Holocaust, mm. which and changed everything. Well, how did it change it? I mean, how did it change the, the immigration toward Palestine? Because it was clear that Jews needed somewhere to go. So people, not un, you know, understandably, felt these people have been murdered and now they are seeking refuge. Again... It wasn't the case that Britain, for example, took in all of these, or was willing to take in all of these refugees. But it wasn't something Britain was forcing to happen. There was a huge wave, or there were large numbers of people just turning up in boats uh, after the Second World War, getting off the boats and, you know, becoming citizens or just taking up land. Mm. Okay. I'm going to ask one more question that may get me in trouble, but um, I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, I've I've heard some people talk about, uh, they point to the Havara Agreement of 1933 as a kind of uh, proof that the uh, Zionists and, and the Nazis were somehow in cahoots. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this because it's a canard. It's a really problematic thing that is completely unnecessary to any argument for Palestinian equality. And I would hope that people would stop going on about it, actually. So let me, can I yes, explain please. it? So after Hitler came to power, some of the Zionist leadership made an arrangement that basically they kind of gave a sale of Jewish assets to the Nazi regime in allowing... Uh, I can't remember the exact number, so it's several thousand, 10,000, 20,000 people to move to Palestine. And this is often because of the status of the Holocaust and Nazism in the kind of pantheon of justifying the fact of the state of Israel. Some people think it's kind of a gotcha to say, oh, but the Zionists collaborated with the Nazis, don't you know? I think this is total nonsense. It's unnecessary. And it's also, when you think about it, quite morally objectionable. Because had I been in their situation, I would say this now, they did nothing wrong. What was wrong is saying these people can go and live in a land that's already inhabited and in a way that is racist by being supreme over the people who currently live there. But in terms of getting people out of a place where they were going to be murdered, every one of those people would have been murdered, doing anything that you can to remove them from it, I think it's totally morally, not objectionable, but right. It was the right thing to do. And you don't need to have this belief or this thing to say the oppression of the Palestinians is wrong. Oppression of the Palestinians is wrong because it's wrong. 
You don't need this this to make it wrong. Okay. Um, John, are you okay to move to the final presentation? Yep, and I'll I'll make it as quick as I can because time's definitely moving on, and we want to give the audience. Um, so what have I got here? Um, I'll, I'll stand up so you can see me. Yes, um, James mentioned the white paper. You know about the World War, World War II and the Holocaust. We can take that as a given. Um, 1942, the Biltmore Programme. I mentioned that earlier, if you remember. That's when um, this Congress in America instituted a program to establish what was called a Jewish Commonwealth in Palestine, aka set up a Jewish state um, that would be a state for Jews. Um, Palestinians could live there, but it would be on the understanding they would be a very much a minority and would be controlled by Jews. You then have 1947, when Britain refers the issue of Palestine back to the UN. Now, Jamie was talking about uh, how uh, you know, the, the, the Zionist militias, the Haganah, but also, um, and the Irgun and so on, began to take action, depending on where you're coming from. It's, it can be called terrorism, or it can be called resistance. Um, the idea being that they were trying to get the British to leave. Um, of course, by getting the British to leave, because Britain had not provided any form of self-determination of the Palestinian people, as I said earlier on, there was no parliament, there was no, um, you know, there was no, the only government there was the Arab, was the British um, administration. And of course, the Zionist movement had its own internal state within a state. So that would have left the Palestinian people, the Arab people of Palestine, completely powerless. Um, so what then happened was in 1947, uh, the strain became too much for Britain to bear. Remember, Britain was bankrupt in the aftermath of World War II. And Britain just referred the issue back to the United Nations, saying, you decide what to do. Um, that led to a resolution to partition Palestine. Now, this was a General Assembly resolution. And it is often said, you often hear the narrative, um, the UN agreed to partition Palestine. The Jewish side, the Zionist movement accepted it. The Arabs rejected it. The Arabs did the wrong thing. They then fought against the um, establishment of the State of Israel, and they lost the war. Tough luck. But, it's, uh, but uh, that, uh, that is not actually the way it is seen by international lawyers. Um, but first of all, I'm going to read you a very short extract from the autobiography of a man called Norman Bentwich. Now, Norman Bentwich came from a very upper crust, very top drawer Jewish family in London. Uh, they were very strong Zionists. His father, Herbert Bentwich, was a leading Zionist around the turn of the century. And he um, was one of the people who welcomed Heim Weizmann to England. And his son, who was a bright boy, became a lawyer, uh, was quite outstanding, I think. And he was also a very committed Zionist. And he became the first attorney general of the Palestine government. But he then fell under the spell of Judah Magnus, who I mentioned earlier. And he came to see there was something dreadfully wrong. And what happened after um, Britain withdrew, Britain said in 1947, right, we're going to leave Palestine by the 15th of May next year, the 15th of May 1948, we will be out. But at that point, basically, Britain abandoned Palestine. The UN partition plan was not legally binding. There was, it was a very provisional plan as well. Um, 
If you read it, and it's worth looking up online, you can find it very easily, you will see it is not something that you, that you just decree. Um, it, it involved a, a huge framework to put it into effect. There would be a commission established to define boundaries and all sorts of things, and none of that happened. So the Palestine partition plan was basically always a dead duck. But the Arab side, immediately it was announced, began kind of, you know, their own bits of guerrilla warfare. Much of it was what one would indisputably call terrorism. Um, but what they were doing was they were fighting to have this reversed because they did not want uh, their land taken away from themselves. Um, what the Zionist side did, it had been preparing for years now for the moment when the British would withdraw and they would set up their state. And they began to implement that. And the difficulty with doing that was, if I can go back for the umpteenth time, the fact that the Palestinian Arabs had no institutions. So if there was lawlessness, you can't really be surprised. The law was enforced by the British police, by the British army, and these were now withdrawing or being disbanded. And the, but the only way that um, Israel could come into existence as a state was by declaring its independence. And before that, in preparation for that, it had to secure the country that would become its own state. And that basically meant, as had been predicted at the time of the Biltmore Declaration, that basically meant we're going to take over control of Palestine by force of arms. Now, in international law, that is what is called secession. And it means armed when a state successfully comes into existence through a, rebe through a rebellion against the lawful sovereign. So, you, so what basically was happening was that the Zionist movement was doing this in Palestine in the late, in late 1947, particularly in the spring of 1948. As the deadline for the British departure grew closer, they began to make sure they could take over as much of the countryside as they could, particularly strategic locations. Um, in con to control the major road arteries in the country, for instance. And that inevitably meant the birth of the Palestinian refugee problem, because the only way this could be effectively do could be done effectively was by emptying many villages, emptying many towns, some cities. Um, if you look at a map of the proposed partition plan, by the way, it never in, you can see it never envisaged either state being completely separate from the other. A principal Arab port was Jaffa. Jaffa was a holy Arab or virtually holy Arab town, but it would be a little enclave surrounded by territory that would go to the Jewish side. And Af Jaffa, for instance, was um, taken and ethnically cleansed by the Jewish militias while Britain was still nominally in control of Palestine. This incidentally led to a great deal of bitterness against Britain in the Middle East, which led on to other things like the Suez Crisis to an extent, but also the 1958 revolution in Iraq when um, the pro-British monarchy was overthrown. Anyway, I mentioned Norman Bentwich. He stayed on. He was Jewish. His family, his wife, his family were Jewish, and I think his family still live in Israel and are Israeli citizens. But at the time of the, but after the Declaration of Independence, he said, and he wrote this in his memoirs called Mandate Days, I think, I should have rejoiced wholeheartedly and offered my services to the state of Israel. <laughs> 
But the way the state had come into being, and particularly the creation of the homeless mass of Arab refugees, were a challenge to conscience. And that, I am afraid, is something that often gets airbrushed from history. On the final day of the mandate, the British government had to ask its lawyers, how are we going to, um, you know, what's our legal position? What happens to Palestine now? Please put all this into a telegram and send it to uh, the British uh, mission to the United Nations so that our ambassador there can know the situation and he can defend the British position. And um, this is one of the things that was said in that legal advice. And I'm going to read it twice. It's not def terribly difficult to understand, but it's very important. And legal things need to be explained clearly. If the Jews claim to set up a state in the boundaries of the Jewish areas as defined by the United Nations partition plan, and the Arabs claim to set up a state covering the whole of Palestine, there would be nothing legally to choose between those claims. Second time, if the Jews claim to set up a state in the boundaries of the Jewish areas as defined by the United Nations partition plan, and the Arabs claim to set up a state covering the whole of Palestine, there would be nothing legally to choose between these claims. So that shows you that the partition plan was not legally binding. And what Britain did was abandon Palestine to chaos and war. So that was the end of the mandate. Um, I think I've said what needs to be said there, but uh, maybe there are people who disagree with things we've said. Maybe there are people who feel we have omitted important things. And so I think probably after anything you might want to ask me or say to me, we should now um, throw it open to the audience. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Jamie wants to say one more thing and then we'll turn it to the audience. Just very uh, quickly uh, about, so a common belief about the foundation of the State of Israel is that it was founded on the 15th of May and the very next day, in fact, the same day, it was attacked by uh, several surrounding Arab states, which is true, that, that did happen. But actually, the, as John said, there was already a conflict going on, and it was one in which the Nakba, the cleansing of the Palestinians, was already happening. So it's a mistake to believe that the Nakba happened because of the war. The war happened because of the Nakba. And that's clear in Israeli documents, particularly those relating to something called Plan Dalit, which Dalit is the Hebrew... D. So there was Plan Aleph, Bet, and so on, ABC, and then eventually settled upon Plan Dalit, which was approved by David Ben Gurion on the 10th of March. The 10th of March, two months before the foundation of the State of Israel, 10th of March 1948. And it consisted of this order to the Haganah, to the commanders of the army. The operations can be carried out in the following manner either by destroying villages, by setting fire to them, by blowing them up by planting mines in the rubble, and especially, as John mentioned, those population centres that are difficult to control permanently. In case of resistance, the armed forces must be wiped out and the population expelled outside the borders of the state. That is in the IDF archives. It's the 10th of March, 1948. On the 9th of April, of course, we've probably heard of the massacre at Deir Yassin, where an entire village were killed. It's not, there were hundreds hundreds of these, which were happening already at this time. Particularly, it's been mentioned Jaffa, because Jaffa and Haifa were big Palestinian commercial centres where there was a leadership kind of elite. In Jaffa, there were 30, 30 families were left out of the entire population. If you go to Jaffa now, you can walk through this. It's quite offensive, actually. You walk through the streets of this kind of Disneyland version of an Arab souk. And the people who live there are not allowed to return to the houses that have been airbrushed and changed into this like 
a tourist attraction. Similar thing happened in Haifa. So there's been a lot of Israeli commentators and politicians call up the, the image, the idea that one day, if too much concessions are given to Hamas or whoever, they'll throw the Jews into the sea, they'll drive them into the sea. And that would be a horrific atrocity. You know, that would be a genocide. That would be ethnic cleansing. That already happened to the people of Haifa. In April, before, so a month before the, dec the declaration of the State of Israel, the so-called the Carmel Brigade of the Haganah were given the job of attacking the Arab quarters of Haifa so that people would leave. And in fact, again, these are in the archives. The, the, br the brigadier, Mordechai Maclef, gave the order, kill any Arab you encounter. So that is in the archives. As a result, 15,000 people left, scattered to the winds, to Gaza, to other refugee camps, and others went to the port of Gaza where they were shelled. Haifa, sorry, port of Haifa, where they were shelled and fired upon until they ran into the sea. They were driven into the sea where they tried to get in fishing boats. Some of them drowned, some of them made it to Lebanon. It already happened to these people. Okay. Um, thank you both for that uh, very detailed uh, four presentations. Um, I think we're now going to turn it to audience Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, obviously, 2,000 years of history is extremely complex, and uh, you, you could do that for every single country. Uh, it would be uh, extremely complicated as well. So uh, obviously I'm not an expert, so forgive me if I'm completely wrong, but I guess probably goes for the, the, the very start, the very first slide, and that probably goes to Jamie. The very first point, my understanding of the, the beginning, I say around the 70, uh, um, so 40 years after the, 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 the death of, uh, of uh, Jesus, the, the, the country of Judah, or they say the kingdom of Judah, was depleted. And was and I think you mentioned briefly that it, it, it was just a very minority of people. It's not like a complete... Because my understanding is that the, the country was depleted. So this, this is called the, the diaspora. And obviously that was a, a, an open gate for people to settle there and, you know... Um, so would that would that be wrong then in this case? So the, this the idea of exodus or diaspora this particular time uh, wasn't quite accurate then. Oh. I I think um, we're talking very ancient history, and I think it's probably a sort of thing that the we can't be sure about what actually happened very often. What I think is important is the memories people have. That's, you know, I mean, I believe there's a theory that much of the Old Testament was written after the Babylonian exile, for instance. Now, I'm not a biblical scholar. I don't know whether it's true or not. I don't think it really matters so much because we're talking about what people today think. And... Um, there, of course, you may have a point that the, um, the re you know, the recollection of those days um, is very important today. Is that what you were trying to say? The, the demography, I mean, I think you mentioned that that's obviously back to more recently, you mentioned 250,000. Doesn't sound a lot, but obviously back in the day, <laughs> we were not overpopulated like today. So I think it, it represents quite a a large population this is obviously something, as you say, two thousand years ago it was difficult to 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 understand what was actually the the population of a country and what exactly happened. And this is always. I mean, I know one thing David Ben Gurion said. You know, the the first prime minister of the state of Israel, the man who took the decision to push the British out and declare independence. Um, he said um, when the um, Nakba happened. Uh, he said, ah, oh, at last we're going to have a properly Jewish country. Because in the days of the Hebrew Bible, in the days of the Hasmoneans and so on, he said the Hasmoneans. I don't know much about who they were. Perhaps you do. But uh, he said, the thing is, in those days, it was never 
a specifically Jewish country because there were so many non-Jews living there. And that is something that is very clear if you read the Bible. I mean, there's no doubt at all you have the whole, why, why was the cult of Baal so influential, of the pagan god Baal? Because people were living there who had, were from before, um, you know, if, if we accept the story of the, the book of Joshua, of the conquest, you know, I gather there's another part of the Bible where it talks about it all happening in a very different way without a conquest at all. And um, there's nothing to suggest that the walls of Jericho were breached in some attack or something, or miraculously fell down, according to archaeological evidence. You know, um, Can I come in there? So I think there are two ways of answering this question. So the first one is what I'm going to say is the professional way in my capacity as, profess as a political scientist, which is to say, this doesn't really matter. That this conflict is not about what happened in 70 AD. It's about what happened between 1880 and 1948. So, and that's important because implying something else would suggest that we accept the notion of kind of descent by blood leading to particular populations having claims to things and others and that there are these groups of people that continue over thousands of years, which historians know is, is, not, is not true. So that really all we need to talk about is what has happened in the past 100 years, and also to some degree the beliefs that those people have that are important for them about the past. Then there's my amateur, like, after five o'clock answer, which is because I have a bit of an interest in biblical history, and because of um, the fact that these things are often referred to, sometimes I read some fairly populist archaeology books. The consensus, as far as I understand with our, this stuff, is it's maybe important to lay this out. There was no exodus. There is no evidence of an exodus. There is no evidence of a united kingdom of David and Solomon. There is no evidence of a historical Moses. The only evidence that there is, is of sedentarization amongst certain nomadic groups in what are now the West, what's now the West Bank. And at some point, they stopped eating pork. So something happened, or at least they stopped having pork pig bones in, the, in this area, around about what people call the Late Bronze Age Collapse. So the, the 11th, 12th century BC. There are some, there are two mentions of Israel or a king of Israel or, you know, Jewish or whatever, biblical king that are not in the Bible, in the whole of the historical record. One of them is an Egyptian stela, you know, monument, which refers to uh, Israel. And that's early. That's about 1100 BC. But it's clear from the context and the hieroglyphics, Israel's not a kingdom. It's a nomadic tribe. So in the same way they're referring to some other nomadic tribes, it might not even be their name for themselves. The Egyptians often used exonyms, so they'd call people by names they made up. Then there is another reference to the house of David, which is about 200 years later. So there's a David, and he has descendants. There's nothing more you can say about that. We do know that there was a kingdom of Israel it was quite uh, successful for two or three hundred years between about 900 and 750 uh, BC. It's not Judah. It's not the place where the Bible happens. It's not the place where the Bible is compiled. It's what it was later called Samaria, the Samaritans. So the, if you're, I'm sure you're all well-schooled in, uh, in your Bible, as you should be, uh, they're constantly being demonized. Jezebel, Ahab, Omri, that's the kingdom of Israel. That is the historical kingdom of Israel. It was taken over by the Assyrians and kind of dispersed, but they remained there and some sort of religion developed that was monotheistic by say the fourth century BC in this area. There was another kingdom, same kind of culture, same set of gods, uh, including this Yahweh figure, in Judah. So the south, where Hebron is, basically this kind of area. 
um, it was much poorer and it accepted a flow of refugees from the Northern Kingdom when it was taken over from Assyria and seems to have developed this religious syncretic thing. The Babylonians then took over, took some of the priestly figures to, it was, you know, the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down and wept because we remembered Zion. That is where the Bible begins to be written. After the Babylonian exile, you get this thing which is basically Yahwehistic monotheism. That wasn't even known or referred to as Judaism until the influence of the Greeks. The reason that we say Judaism is it's the, it's the belief system of the people of Judah facing the Hellenists, of which the Hasmoneans were one. The Hasmoneans were a, a lineage, they were a group of monarchs, Hellenizers, so they wanted to be more like the Greeks translated the Torah, which was being written at that time, into Greek, so the Septuagint, which is written in Egypt. All this stuff was going on, and then there was the Roman, basically this is a client state of the Roman Empire by the time of Jesus. Rabbinical Judaism, the thing that is now regarded as Judaism, there are other types of Judaism, but the thing that is now regarded as Judaism developed at the same time as Christianity. Christianity and Judaism were not separate religions until about a, a century after the death of Christ. The diaspora is not, as far as most archaeologists are concerned, made up of people expelled from Judah, but rather people who were converted in the Roman Empire to Judaism. No, perfectly. Thank you so much. Just a short comment, but I just want to say that, unfortunately, i say 2,000 years later, the Bible still has a huge influence on, on today. And Absolutely. That, that's uh, uh, unfortunate. Uh, well, it depends. Like, there are lots of other things in the Bible, you know, love thy neighbor, do not kill. Like, there are good things in the Bible. Yeah. Great. Thank you both for a great discussion. My question is Did the UN ever try and promote a single state, which is Palestine, and like normal assimilation of the Jewish people after the war? Or was, uh, did they only ever consider dividing the country? into the two states and where did, did this idea originate from? Right. Um, the UN, of course, only came into existence in 1945. And at the time of 1945, what was there was the British mandate. So the first time that the UN really looked at it was when Britain said in, I think, in at some stage in 1947, I can't remember mm. exactly when, we're handing the the problem back to the UN. Uh, because the UN, uh, it would have been handed back to the League of Nations, but that no longer existed and had been taken over by and had been replaced by the UN. Now, partition wasn't the only suggestion that was made. It was also suggested that uh, Palestine should become a UN trust territory, which would have been um, something like a mandate, a similar concept. Uh, maybe in the hands of the United Nations rather than an imperial power. Um, there was also the suggestion that there should be a, a ruling sought from the International Court of Justice on what to do, but I don't know much about that, so I can't talk about it. But though the point is these ideas were also there in the mix at the same time as the idea of partition was put forward. And as I said, Partition was only ever a provisional idea. It was not legally binding. And um, right up until almost the very last moment of the mandate, it was thought, you know, the, the Arab side was pressing for the partition concept to be abandoned. And um, it was thought that might happen. And, there was, and that was when the suggestion came that, um, you know, the ICJ should be asked for a ruling on this. After 1940, then in 1948, you have the proclamation of the State of Israel. Um, incidentally, it was refused admission to the United Nations on the first two applications because it wasn't felt that, you know, because of the chaos I mentioned, it wasn't felt the situation was sufficiently stable. But then come 1949, Israel had armistice agreements with all its neighbours when the war came to an end. And after that, the UN said, right, fair enough, and uh, enough powers 
um, enabled it to, to go through the Security Council for Israel to be admitted to the UN, but not until that on its third attempt. After that, the UN, of course, always remained seized of the Palestine problem, as it would put it. Um, that's because it hadn't been finally resolved. The borders of Israel were always provisional. Um, but there's never, you know, the idea of a Palestinian state, uh, although there was an attempt to proclaim one um, after Israel had proclaimed its independence, it, it never really got off the ground. Um, and you, as you probably know, at the end of the fighting in '49, the West Bank and East Jerusalem were under Jordanian occupation. Jordan tried to incorporate them into Jordan. Gaza was under Egyptian military occupation, but Jordan never tried to um, uh, incorporate them it into Egypt. And then Palestine come, begins to come back in the 1970s um, with the idea of um, you know, the PLO becoming the permanent representative of the, of the Palestinian people. Um, and from there you go on to today. But no, there's never been anything since apart from the idea of what do you do with the occu occu territories occupied by Israel in 1967? And the, and the answer is they have, in international law is they have the right of self-determination, which means they have the right to declare their own state, um, subject to various, but there are various formalities to go through which haven't yet been achieved. That, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Hi, folks. Um, Thank you very much to the two speakers, but I'm going to start actually with the, the, the organisers. I think it was absolutely brilliant to start this event, to start this conversation. I do have a little bit of a concern, though, which is, as Jamie pointed out at the start, there's no Palestinians on the platform. That's understandable. Um, I think, Jamie, you said they were too busy and too afraid. There's neither other Israelis on the platform. And um, without wishing to criticise at all the speakers, who I think have been very eloquent, it does feel a fairly narrow uh, uh, breadth of opinion. I think you would probably agree with lots of things. So I look forward to the, the next two events having a, a broader platform. Can I just ask what efforts were made by the organisers? And this is not at all a hostile question because I think, think this has been a, a great event um, to kind of broaden out the platform so that we can really get a debate. Because like Matthew, this is something I want to learn more about. Um, a question then for, for uh, the speakers. Both of you, when talking about anti-Semitism, um, really placed the responsibility for anti-Semitism historically with uh, Christian Europe. Uh, and, and John, in particular, talked about the blood libel um, as being a medieval Christian invention. I think it's um, St. William of Norwich, I think, is the, uh -huh. is the first uh, recorded. But could I ask specifically about anti-Semitism from within the Muslim world and within uh, uh, Muslim thought and Muslim political practice? I, I can do that. I mean, I would, I, th I think Athan will probably say about the story of the organisation. I would say that as somebody who works in this area, and kind of is working in political science and history, and John's also a historian, in terms of somebody who would put a uh, a narrative that substantively kind of is different to this. There's almost no one who works professionally as a scholar or an academic who would do that because the facts as historically established are basically this. There is a debate. Um, I mean, of course there's a debate. There's always a debate. But very few people working professionally in the history of the region would dispute it. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't exist. And by all means, you know, have a have a discussion about it. But I would just want to make the point that it's like saying, why aren't there people who challenge climate change on a panel about climate change? You know, there are people who challenge it, but there is reasonable amount of evidence uh, that forms a consensus. So on the second point, I think we'll have to distinguish between what Arno Mayer in his book about the Holocaust, Why Did the Heavens Not Darken, uh, calls Judeophobia and anti-Semitism. So Judeophobia 
he refer, he's referring to the particular uh, religious persecution of the Jews, which is something that is a feature of Christian Europe. That's different to anti-Semitism, which is racism that is about Jews. And racism is a recent concept. You know, the idea that there's a race, right? It's a biological inherited group. That has some origins, I think, particularly in the Iberian expulsion, where there's this idea of the purity of the blood. So do you have this amount of Muslim heritage, this amount of Jewish heritage? It means bio it's a biological thing. But it really came about in the 19th century as a response to modernity, as a response to kind of ideas of modern nationhood, as a response to modern society, that there's this group that somehow control it. And that's a common... That's the common thing about anti-Semitism. It's the idea that Jews are controlling things. It's not like anti-black racism, which is saying these are inferior people. In some sense, they're superior. They have the money, they have the, the control. That narrative, that idea, is completely absent from Islamic thought until the late 19th century. There is prejudice. There is prejudice against Christians, much more so against Christians than Jews, actually. Uh, there's prejudice against non people who don't belong to the same sect of Islam as you, Shia against Sunni, Sunni against Shia. But they all operate in the same way, which is that these people are wrong, they're misbelievers, they're a threat by their fact of not belonging to the Ummah. There's no particular distinction about Jews. They're often attacked, but they're attacked in the same way that Christians and other Muslim sects are. Anti-Semitism in this specific form of racism that is about Jews as an imagined race, that really starts to take off. I mean, I mentioned the blood libel in Damascus. It, that is the starting point, really. In the 1890s and the early 1900s, Islamic writers like Rashid Ridda uh, began to really run with this. So this is after Zionism is happening, and they were absorbing the kind of anti-Semitic and racist ideas from European thinkers. Um, which are kind of reappearing in their, their writing. And so you get emergence of things like the blood libel, protocols of the elders of Zion. But as a specific idea about Jews as a race, it doesn't exist. Discrimination, yeah. I mean, the whole state was based upon supremacy of the Islamic group, with Christians being in a, Christians and Jews being a special poll tax, not being allowed to do certain jobs. But it's not the same thing as the later form of racial anti-Semitism, I think. Um, I'd like to add a little bit to that, but I think the, you had a point for the organizers, didn't you? Yeah, I can, I can come in on that. Um, uh, it was very important for Athen and I, I as Michael said, um, that we have a wide variety of perspectives um, on this conversation. And we did make quite a large effort. We reached out to a lot of external organizations, uh, student societies, I emailed every head of college department. Um, we, 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 and we had a couple of speakers lined up that didn't work out. Um, so we, uh, we did our best, I will say, to try and, to try and bring that about. But, uh, could, I, could I just add a couple of things on, on the question of the Arab world and anti-Semitism? Um, as Jamie said, I think anti-Semitism, in the way we've been describing it, is a, is a Western import into the Arab world. But that doesn't mean there weren't negative um, attitudes towards Jews. And, um, you know, they, they, I, I would mention a couple of things. One is, um, I don't know if you've come across the work of Bernard Lewis. Yeah. Um, he says that, uh, in I, I can't remember the quote exactly, but it's indisputably negative attitudes always existed towards Jews, uh, as they did towards other minority groups. Um, but he says, but there is nothing to compare with the anti-Semitism of the, of the Christian world. Um, so that's one thing. Um, another thing I, I think it's uh, important to, to say is that um, today the whole question of um, this area has become rather contentious because it's seen through a political prism. Uh, through a political prism, you've got the neo lacrimose version of history, um, and to some extent, people um, you will you will get this. For instance, if you read 
Benjamin Netanyahu's a durable peace. Um, you know, his his formula for how peace should be reached with uh, between Israel and its neighbors. And he goes into, um, you know, he, he tries to bring up a lot of um, examples of anti-Jewish hatred in the Islamic world. And you've got that on the one hand, and on the other, you've got the, if you like, Arab nationalist <laughs> version of history that um, says uh, everything was always rosy in the garden. You know, uh, everyone lived happily together um, people, late 19th century Islamic thinkers said, actually, Islam is far more tolerant than anything coming out of the West. If, if, we, if we looked into Islam to find forms of, of government for ourselves, we'd find a much better form of democracy than what you have in the West and things like that. And they would have denied that there was any kind of anti-Jewish racism at all. Um, I think it's an area, frankly, that there is a lot of discussion to be had about, because, of course, new historical facts keep on coming up. And let me, on the question of historical facts, tell you a very quickly, tell you a very interesting little story from the 18th century, which is germane to this. Uh, there was a guy called Nader Shah, Nadir Shah, who was sometimes called the Napoleon of the East. He was a Shah of Iran. And he was a great conqueror, most famous for carrying off the peacock throne from the Mughals in Delhi after he plundered the place. Well, he also conquered Iraq from the Ottomans. And Nader Shah had a problem. Half his army was Shi'i and half of it was Sunni. So he suddenly, this great warlord, thought, ah, I'm going to, ex I'm going to establish harmony in religion and I'll be remembered forevermore and be blessed for this in my memory. And so he got a lot of um, Shi'i divines to debate, and there were plenty of them in Iraq. And they had a Sunni who was to, up to debate against them. And he, was, and he said, God, I just can't do this because I'm going to be terribly outnumbered. What we need is someone who is a legitimate chair. Now, I'm a Shi'i, they're all Sunnis. Sorry, I'm a Sunni and they're all Shi'is. They will, they will fab, you know, and, and then he went on with a lot of anti-Shi'i prejudice, actually. But then he said something quite remarkable. He said, what we need is a devout man, he did say a man, I'm afraid, who believes in God and fears the day of judgment. What we need is a Jew or a Christian to be the arbiter in all of this. Now, I do not think in any dispute between Christians, you would get the suggestion that they should have a Muslim as an arbitrator. And I didn't think in any, or a Jew, and I didn't think in any dispute among Jews, you would have the suggestion they should have a Christian or a Muslim as an arbitrator. And therefore, I mention that story because I, I do think there is, um, you know, you, you do not have the history of persecutions that disfigure the history of Christian Europe in Islam. When the Ottomans, the greatest Sunni power of the day, persecuted their Shias, it was only for one of two reasons. They weren't pay, paying their taxes on time. Or they were, for some reason, this particular little group had allied themselves with someone and had therefore become a political threat. And as you probably know, southern Lebanon, where Hezbollah now is, is a predominantly Shi'i area. It was in Ottoman days. Generally, the local governor was a Shi'i. The Ottomans didn't care a damn. He just had to collect the taxes and maintain order. So there is, I think, a deep-seated Islamic tolerance that, frankly, is not part of our history in the West, and we're not culturally used to thinking of it. I hope that's of interest. Uh, well, I'm not going to dispute the Armenian genocide. You know, but the but they be but why did that happen? It happened because they be, they were perceived as a political threat.
No, it wasn't. It wasn't. Be, it wasn't because throughout history they'd been massacring Armenians. But I think this is an important example, actually, because what the Armenian genocide and there, were, <clears throat> there was also a similar one in Iraq. It's little known, the twenties show, is actually the impact of an idea of universal citizenship. Like Michael Mann has written about this in his book about genocide. That's what happened. The idea that there's a universal citizenship applying to a people. So the people has to be defined. And they're often defined upon pre-existing categories. In the case of Turkey, Sunni, not by religious people. And this, this is secular nationalists, Kemalists, or pre-Kemalists who did it. Sunni, Turkic speaking, um, basically excluding Christians. So no longer part of the national community. It's a similar thing happening to Jews in Eastern Europe, no longer seen as part of the community that is now secularized. So it's actually that process, I would argue, that led to that genocide and others. It's not that everything was rosy in the garden, as John said. There were lots of massacres of Jews and Christians in the Islamic world. But there's a different way of dealing with the fact of religious difference, which is to have a kind of basically negotiated solution about it rather than an exclusionary one. Thank you, guys. And this gentleman here. Uh, thank you very much for the deep dive in the history. I think it's fair to say most people in the UK wouldn't have nearly um, as good an understanding of British history as you've laid out of Palestine. Um, that there is a, it's fair to say that there's a clear gap between the history that you've laid out and the perspective that you put forward and the um, political climate and the um, uh, zeitgeist in terms of uh, the conflict um, what do you feel is the role of the university and of education um, in bridging this gap in narratives and uh, or do you, even, do you even think that is an important um, thing to this is an important uh, piece of history to teach yeah I think it's vital but I think it shouldn't just be at universities it should be in secondary schools uh, but there is an issue that's emerged in recent years, the adoption by this university and others of the International Holocaust Remembrance Association definition of anti-Semitism, which it's not that we shouldn't remember the Holocaust. Of course we should. We should teach more about it. But that, that definition specifically actually prevents us from talking about the accurate history as established from the relevant documents about this foundation of the State of Israel. And it results in people not, and I know that this is happening because of fears for their jobs, um, not teaching courses, not taking part in debates, not actually being able to talk about the accurate history that's happened. So I think that that is one thing that we should really consider rescinding. Um, it, that doesn't mean being soft on anti-Semitism. That doesn't mean permitting it. But I think we need to be able to talk about what actually happened. There is another definition of anti-Semitism called the Jerusalem definition of anti-Semitism. And I think that is well worthy of more study. I think it would be a better one than the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance one, which was never intended to be used in the way it is now being used. Um, thank you both for the contributions that you made. It was really uh, interesting to to listen to you. Um, the question I have is one that I've had for a really long time, and I think perhaps the, between the two of you, I hopefully might get a good answer to it. Um, when it comes to the issue of, of Zionism, I sometimes think that we look at it through a modern day lens. I know that I certainly do, do that. Um, and as someone who is sort of sympathetic to the Palestinian cause, uh, I sometimes maybe neglect to to fully weigh up um, the Israeli cause as well. And obviously this is why we're here, to, to, to learn about these things. And you both spoke tonight about how Zionism was born out of a situation of anti-Semitism, of oppression of, of Jewish people in Europe. Um, and I guess I would ask sort of and objectively, if possible, not subjectively, um, what other alternative was there uh, for Jewish people? So there have been lots of nationalisms established throughout history that we're all supportive and sympathetic towards. So why should we not be sympathetic to Zionism, objectively? Um, and what would have been a better outcome? So obviously what we have now is not good. 
but also the, the Jews in Europe did need uh, some sort of positive outcome for them. So what would have been better um, rather than this timeline that we've seen now? Thank you. Sorry, just very quickly, we do only have five minutes left before we uh, have to vacate the premises. Thank you. Well, I think the better outcome would have been the victory of progressive forces in Europe in the 1920s rather than those that represented the kind of reaction that murdered the Jews of Europe. Um, and on that basis, I would say, I would want to make clear, I've, as nationalisms go, well, Zionism is a completely understandable one. You're facing literal obliteration because you're not regarded as a member of the state community of the state, it makes a lot of sense to think we need that state of our own. And that is what they were trying to do. It, it, it's a totally understandable objective. The point isn't that objective. It's that in the only way that it can be achieved is to produce a tragedy because it means the removal of another people. And then where do they go? Do they have to remove another people? The logic is one of endless chain of ethnic cleansing and oppression. Um, so it's a tragedy rather than a kind of uh, thing that I would say you can't possibly understand. Because not only did the Holocaust destroy this kind of cosmopolitan world of European Jewish life, secondary consequence of that was the destruction of the Palestinian world. And then because of that, we we'll talk about this probably the next time, I don't know, the destruction by people who were very definitely doing making anti-Jewish statements, anti-Jewish riots in the Arab world, of the cosmopolitan, um, non-kind of uh, nationalist Jewish Middle Eastern culture, which was the predominant one, as I said, that's the majority part of the Jewish world. And now Baghdad was the most Jewish city in the world till the 1950s, not New York, not Krakow, center of Jewish culture and religion. I think now there might be 10 Jews in Baghdad. I think three. Three, sorry. So even worse. Um, yeah. it, it's a cycle. Uh, and it can't be, it can't be I think, uh, addressed by staying within its logic. I'd agree with that. Um, the trouble is one can't go down the history, the history of what might have happened. Um, why, you know... Um, but I think to solve things today, you have to understand the past. And that involves in understanding the Holocaust, for instance. It involves understanding why Zionism happened. But it also involves understanding, you know, what happened to the Arabs of Palestine. You know, um, I, I, I mean, it's often said, you know, the Arab states are often accused of having kept the Palestinian refugees refugees indefinitely. Uh, but think of Gaza and the West Bank. Well, let's think in, of Gaza, where two thirds of the population are refugees and their descendants. That's been under Israeli occupation since 1967. Um, why hasn't Israel ever done anything about those people? And Israel denies any responsibility. That is why I think it's important to understand the Nakba, because that it, does, it, it does not wash, it will not work if you want to have peace for it, that to continue to be denied. Um, and the trouble is, both sides have so, well, have no trust in each other. And the only way to do that is by investigating these things, talking them through and discussing them. I, I must say, um, I, there were some questions that I was expecting people might be asking me that um, would challenge me as a supporter of the Palestinian side, and which I had my answers to. But I'm rather disappointed not to be have been able to talk about things like the Faisal Weizmann agreement, mm. um, which I I would say, if anyone's wondering what I think about it, I think it's completely irrelevant because it was an agreement between the Kingdom of the Hejaz and the World Zionist Organization, and neither had a right in 1920, when, or whenever it was, to make an agreement about Palestine, you know, over the heads of the Palestinian people. 
And that's a wonderful place to stop. I think if we can give our speakers an anthem a round of applause. Thank you very much.